wanted to mainly the presentation how I found the market for my fashion designs, how possibly I sell stuff when I'm so small and I'm actually one person business who's doing absolutely everything. So my background is that I didn't study fashion design. I graduated in 2013 with masters in business. I found that studies bullshit and I was like, I don't want to do that. I had an experience of working in American corporate work and I was like, okay, this is what I do. And the same year, the same month when I graduated, I also opened my food recycling business. And since then, it's been five years since I'm operating and I'm selling stuff. So it's kind of good. Uh, well, regarding, uh, because I'm doing everything from the design to the handmade product, the final product. And, um, you know, these five years have been mainly like learning how to cut, learning how to make the pattern, le learning how to sew, everything. It's not only designing. And I made a pattern making course at the Krakow Fashion and Art School that everyone knows uh, under the name Sapu. And I also made there one semester of studies uh, and I quit because, to be honest, I just went for vacation to Japan and then I couldn't catch up the stuff that I had to do for the finals. And then I was in the first summer school in Castoria that was uh, sponsored by International Food Federation. And I took part in the Vogue Talents Remix competition last year, which didn't uh, let me go to the finals, but I was visiting me for some of the biggest event in this industry in February. So even though my papers and my LinkedIn says something like I'm economist and business and working in corporations and generally administrative work, I'm actually making clothes and I run bespoke fashion business. So how I came up with my business idea, I was there on my last year, uh, last semester of studies in Oslo, in Norway. I didn't figure out before I went there that it's so damn expensive. So the last month I was totally broke and my friend said like, listen Marla, sell this vintage fur coat that you have to the concept store. They are gonna pay you this and this. And I was like, man, how much? I paid for this like five times less in Poland. And it was already customized. And he said like, okay, so go just sell it. You're gonna have for drinks and stuff. And I didn't sell it because I really like that code. But that got me thinking like, I'm gonna come back to Poland and I'm gonna start doing that. And my business is basically, it comes from who I am because I'm a bit eccentric. I like extravagant fashion, but I also, love recycling and zero waste attitude and using stuff that are considered for many people a waste i'm making this stuff into gold it's either in fashion and in uh, interior design and in many aspects of my life i'm just reusing what is vintage what is waste what is serious like literally rubbish and i'm doing some good stuff out of it that people are buying so it's slow fashion. This is the business that is totally slow fashion, bespoke, which means made to measure for particular client. I don't do mass production. I don't use factories. I'm sewing everything myself. And this is about social consciousness and the trends that are changing in fashion and generally in the world and sustainability. My attitude towards fashion is more and more and less is more, which is said by Iris Apfel that you probably know, a 96 year old fashion icon from America. And uh, this is my studio and my machine. I believe maybe it's kind of like vintage thinking and old school thinking, but I believe that craftsmanship and technical skills and precision it's something very important to the design and this is what nowadays people that have let's say medium and up budget buying because mass production and fast fashion it's getting more and more criticized because of obvious obvious reasons like very low quality and using you know i don't know ch children to work and this kind of stuff 
So these are the tools. This is very blurred. I cannot see almost nothing here, so you guys probably will not recognize none of these. But these are the tools of the Fourier and uh, or a dressmaker when you're doing the bespoke uh, clothing. What I also believe, this is from the uh, Audemars Piguet, the Swift uh, luxury watches advertisement. They say, to break the rules, you must first master them. And this is what I totally believe in. I was always appreciating people who were very skillful, technical, uh, and they, they have some, craft, some kind of craft that is impressing that they know so much about certain thing. And this is what I'm doing. I'm already sewing for five years. And um, I think another two, and I'm gonna be really a master for you. <laughs> this is me working. This is the machine. Um, I'm just under. Uh, I'm just saying that I'm doing everything. What I do in the recycling, the recycling is I'm buying the vintage huge fur coats like that are 30, 40 years old. I am dismantling them to zero. I'm making the plate, so I'm patchworking all the pieces. Then I'm making the pattern based on measurements of the client. Then I'm doing the trial uh, sewing on the regular fabric. And then I'm doing the final product with hand finishing. So I not only design, but I also do the whole sewing service. Uh, how the fur coats look before my makeover? It's something like this, very old school and not cool. And now after, these are my collections from 2013. Uh, what is called what I'm doing is um, I'm doing recycling. So it's the most greener attitude in fashion, but generally with furs and shelling and sheepskin and leather and high quality fabrics, it's called fur haute couture. Haute couture, uh, you probably know this term. This is the high-end made to measure clothing. So it's like unique pieces. This is what high fashion designers like Chanel, Gucci, when they are doing the runway show. These items are usually like made, for example, two weeks, three weeks, one piece of clothing. And this is what they call haute couture. Uh, how and where I start selling my designs, because everyone could be an artist, everyone can, who has a good aesthetics and, you know, design staff, but then you also have to sell them to in order to be successful. So I sell online. This is the Shopify uh, based um, uh, my uh, uh, online shop, which I made myself because I don't want to spend money on a software engineer. So I said, okay, I'm going to use Shopify and do it myself. It turned out to be pretty good. And people were asking, oh, who did you hire to this? But it was five years ago. Now Shopify and this kind of websites are pretty popular, so everyone is using that. And this is still the website, the website. And my main source of money and general popularity is Etsy. Probably no Etsy or not, because I don't know how many of you are interested in fashion. But this is the American portal, 20 years old, uh, for handmade fashion. And there I sell a lot. This is uh, my portfolio with all the stuff that I did. Uh, so my website. Sometimes I'm selling on Allegro. Some fashion designers saying that selling on Allegro is not good because it's lowering your brand image and stuff. But I believe that if it brings me money and if I sell there, it's I don't feel you know embarrassed or whatever. It's okay. I'm also planning to to launch some accessories on Davanda. Davanda works this way. This um, you have to have translation into certain languages. So I'm gonna have it in English, in Polish, in German, and in German, which I speak a bit, and in Spanish that speaks my boyfriend. So he's gonna do the job of translating. Uh, the showroom, which is very well known for fashion, Polish independent market, they rejected me because they said it's too expensive. But um, that's okay. The events that I took part in Krakow that I recommend for everyone is Kiermash and the uh, Krak Fashion Festival that doesn't happen again. But um, it's good. There's also Hash Warsaw that is very good, but it's more when you're doing actually a production. Because the entrance there is 3,000 slots. 
So in order that you're gonna actually get enough clients, you need to 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 do more things than you know 15 items in collection. So who visits my websites that I do zero marketing for? Zero. I never use any traffic agencies or nothing. So it's almost like a miracle that they are <laughs> visiting my websites, but they do. And from my uh, horrorbeatsonline.com website, United States is 30%, then Poland, then Canada, United Kingdom, Germany, and the rest of the world. And Etsy, also United States, but it's 40%, Poland, United Kingdom, Canada, Germany, France, Italy, and the rest. Why America? I don't know, because these guys probably, they look for unique products. Second of all, all my websites, they have never been in Polish, they have always been in English, so it's easier in the search engines throughout five years to be searched by particular terms. Uh, I think Etsy is very cool for everyone, even though there's, mm, there's so many products and so many sellers, but they run the, the stati stats for you, they run the, uh, all the analyzes, they offer marketing, they offer marketing, everything, so I'm really happy that in 2015 I started selling for Etsy. This is almost not visible, but who buys my designs? Uh, in a way, by, by the, the country. Because going to the website is one, but then who buys that? So in Poland, but Polish customers, they mainly use the bespoke stuff. So bespoke services, like they are bringing the old fur coat of the grandma and I'm remodeling for them. America, I'm selling most of my collection to America and to Canada and to European countries like UK, Great Britain, London, mainly London, but villages too. Some, uh, I'm always checking on Google View where the people, when the person that orders lives. Why? Because <laughs> I want to make sure that this is accurate address, that there's not enough, you know, there's something, some kind of building, because sometimes they are forgetting to put, uh, I don't know, the, the number of the apartment, whatever. And once I was Googling and I found uh, literally a palace like of the princess in Wales, and I was like, hell yeah, my recycled fur coat for like uh, 900 slotters, it's going there to the palace in Wales. Uh, then the Czech Republic, France, all that you see, Sweden, uh, Finland, Germany, Portugal, Italy, Spain, when there's zero winter, Singapore, zero winter, Taiwan, zero winter, Japan, one month of winter. And I'm selling, I don't want to, to, to I don't know if I'm screaming too much, and probably, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, and <laughs> I'm screaming and I'm just too like, oh my god, oh my god, but I'm just selling to these countries, which is a miracle to myself, like I feel like it's not uh, no, normal, I don't know. So America, the biggest market in everywhere, from Chicago to San Francisco, New York, of course, because in New York it's a bit colder, so there's most of my clients. I have also in New York uh, three out of four of my clients that are like coming back to me all the time and they are referring me to other ladies. So this is really cool because they are my bread every year. Uh, Canada, Singapore, Taiwan, Japan, I said that. Who is my client? What kind of person? So I'm not selling to teenagers, hello, because it's too expensive and the, the product is a bit, you know, unique, so <laughs> the teenagers are not so interested in buying this kind of stuff. Mostly I'm selling to the ladies that are between 40 and 60. But they are fashion conscious, they are... I'm, a, I'm very close with my clients, even if they are living in New York or in Vienna or in uh, Japan because they, they are very interested why I'm doing that and I'm interested in why you're buying that. And they are saying, man, there is no store like this in New York. Man, there's no store like this in Vienna. There's no store like this in Tokyo. And I'm like, guys, thank you so much. It's awesome, but uh, you know, then I'm talking with them. I figured out that they have the income that they can buy the new one, but they still choose what I do, a small Marta in Krakow. So, it's cool. They are one of my biggest clients. Is uh, she's a professor from Columbia University, and she's actually writing books about the skills of women in the world in fashion. And she's Chinese. And also, a lot of my clients are Asian. 
Everyone who doesn't appreciate Asian clients doesn't know much about the business. At least I'm talking about fashion and luxury fashion. Because if not China, there would be no Gucci, no Chanel, no one. Uh, I'm telling this from the experience of, go uh, experience of going to fashion weeks and fashion fairs in Milan and stuff. And you see that most of them are Chinese. Uh, so why even have so many clients with little marketing? Because the price is fair and to be direct, I'm cheaper than the Fourier or the designer Fourier in Vienna or New York or London or Paris or in Milano. It's around 1,500 euros for the job. I'm four times less. So that's why they choose me for, from the first place. They like the aesthetics. So the fair, pr fair price, it's a highly customized product, the value for money, quality, uniqueness, and the happy client recommends me further or buy another thing because this is addiction. My rule number one, I never rip off my clients. A lot of people were telling me like, oh, if you know that she has money, give a higher price, higher price. And I'm like, no man, because I know with this price I'm happy and I know she will come back, she will recommend me further and stuff. And this is exactly what is happening. And rule number two, even though I'm an artist and a designer, I don't impose my artistic visions over people that want to buy something. Because every lady has different lifestyle, every lady has different body time, height and stuff. And, you know, you can be like so focused on an artistic vision that you forget that you're actually doing it for normal people, not for the runway and not for the models. So <clears throat> it's very important that you actually listen to them. So it's a niche business and as much as the biggest disadvantage of that is that it's a very small business, that very little people are doing this, very little people are interested in this, but at the same time it's the advantage because I'm here, they are there in, in America and they, they, they buy from me and they even give me the bespoke jobs. They spend their time on emailing with me, sending photos, telling, you know, giving measurements. This is, this is not, let's say, this is not normal situation that somebody puts so much engagement into cooperating with somebody else. So on um, this, uh, this autumn, I'm planning to do a little fur accessories collections. Of course, everything recycled, mixed with wool and sweater and leather. Uh, the location, I'm from Krakow, born, raised and based. And the location also implies that, first of all, there are cheap second hands where I'm buying this, uh, this stuff. And uh, second of all, um, well, the money I make here, it's relatively good because our country is just poorer country than America or something. So that's why they choose me probably. Aha, also I have Polish clients and I have clients from Krakow. And to be honest, 80% of the clients from Krakow is the girls that I got to know into the, in the parties. So most also in this place before now I don't party so much but like two years ago three years ago and the ladies were like oh I like your style and then oh I'm doing that and that so because I know a lot of people from this city uh, I also have uh, clients here my image in social media so I'm using everything like Instagram Facebook Pinterest and I'm planning to do the blog well you know, it's important to be in social media, but I don't pay so much attention anymore to Instagram, for example, with the fake likes and the bans on hashtags and all that stuff that you probably heard about. So I'm just active, but at the same time, I'm not following people to follow me back. But I'm just using the hashtags. This is my profile, so I have only 1,823 followers, so this is nothing. But this is zero visible and uh, I, what I mean that with Instagram you have to use certain hashtags not like hashtag Polish girl or hashtag mood or hashtag Monday because then it's three billion photos of this hashtag but something that is like kind of explaining your business so I'm using 
zero waste, for designer, sustainable fashion, eco fashion, repurposing vintage for, for upcycling, recycled for, and stuff like this. And after these hashtags, they are fighting me. What is important if you're... Is there even one person who's thinking about doing some fashion business? Oh, there are. Okay, good, good. Because I was thinking I'm talking only to software engineers and then they will be like, what is she even talking about, you know? So, okay, awesome. What I recommend to everyone uh, who's trying to do some kind of fashion is working with the stylist. This is zero costs because the stylist the good stylist is taking, is borrowing one of your items to do a nice editorial, and it doesn't cost you nothing. She's she's happy because she has an, she has awesome clothes, not from Zara or something to the editorial, and you have awesome photos. So this is the list of the uh, of the fashion studies that I recommend and that I was working with. This is my absolute favorite photo. It was uh, by uh, Asha Baumgartner. She was making <laughs> the calendar for the company that is doing the, you know, the funeral stuff, the coffins. And this is the beautiful naked lady in my full scarf, which you cannot see because the, the, the vision is not good. This is for the, I'm doing the stuff for the weddings. This is all with the, with the editorials. Who wrote about me? I am a fashion revolution member, which means that, you know, the slow fashion stuff and conscious fashion and sustainability. What I want to say that even last year, I'm doing this for five years, some designers in the world, like Issey Miyake from uh, Japan, he's doing for, uh, not for, but he's doing clothing recycling for 20 years. But even last year, Zara and H&M, which are the biggest fast fashion companies, they made the recycled collections. They used the uh, stuff in the stock and they recycled the old fabrics into make, of course, these collections weren't on sales because uh, there were one items only, but they show like publicity, like guys, we also appreciate recycling and making less harm to the environment. Uh, okay, fashion business wrote about me. Design for Longevity is a Danish fashion institute. They also wrote about me that they appreciate the idea and it's so sustainable and eco-friendly. Sustainably chic and um, I am a member of We Are Four. So, these are the conclusions that I think that nowadays not everyone has to be a big business. You know, like people they are having some kind of works and then they are dreaming, oh, I'm going to be a millionaire, I'm going to have 300,000 companies. And I think you can go small and still be good, make money, do the products that people appreciate and love. It happens to me that after, you know, three years, a lady is writing to me like, oh, Marta, I'm so, I'm so happy I found you. And, you know, I've already forgot that I sold this thing. And they are, seriously, I'm getting the messages that um, are so nice and I am so small. So I think this is like the past generation was like, oh, we have to be big. We have to go big or go home. What is a go big or go home? In 90% is go bankrupt and go home and come back to corporate work. So I think it's good for some people. For some, pe some people are great to make great, huge businesses and money like war. But in fashion, it's very competitive, and I think it's good start for some to start very small, to start with little niche handmade handmade stuff that people will appreciate all around the world, the design and the aesthetics, and you're gonna sell, and then you can go bigger and bigger and bigger. But you know, like baby steps, and you're gonna get there. But <laughs> this is, of course, very individual. Some people will hate on that because what is she saying? Go small, what, what the hell? But I think we need more uh, new business models like that. The small businesses. This is the models of the you know, twenties, uh, thirties, forties. The small businesses, not a mass production for everyone. Also, I uh, recommend that before you start a big fashion business, you start first with fine craftsmanship, or at least you hire someone who knows how to make clothes, technically. Because design is nothing without technical skills. 
And also, of course, I recommend patience, especially with sewing, with constructing and all those technical stuff. Uh, it requires years of experience. I made around 60 coats so far. Each coat is minimum three days, up to seven, eight days. When you have more haute couture um, design, so a lot of elements and stuff, one coat I was making seven weeks. Seven weeks of sewing. And well, this is not like you imagine two hours uh, long job of making uh, jackets, I don't know, in a factory, you know? So I think persistent pays off. And I think everyone who's doing business thinks the same. And with the time comes experience and clients. I have clients from the very beginning, but every year more and more and more. And I have the other job, and I always had other jobs, meantime doing this, but all of the jobs are flexible in a way like I don't have to get stressed that, oh, this month I have no clients and I have no money. No, I have both because the clients are waiting when I'm doing other other job or whatever. Uh, this is the end. This is the skirt I made. I'm very I'm very sad that you know. Unfortunately, <laughs> this presentation was mainly about the aesthetics of the design, and you cannot appreciate nothing when you don't see it. But um, I'm gonna send the presentation to the event. If anyone is uh, interested, uh, you can have a look. And more in my portfolio and Instagram. On Instagram, I'm also posting other stuff regarding also interior design that I'm kind of planning going towards. And that's it.